He is the most famous dwarf in all of Middle-earth, a descendant of Durin the Deathless, a fearless warrior and the only dwarf ever allowed to sail to the undying lands of Valinor. His name was Gimli, son of Gloin, elf friend, lock bearer, and lord of the glittering caves, and today we will learn his tale. Gimli, son of Gloin, was born in the Blue Mountains in the year 2879 of the Third Age. When his father joined the company of Thorin Oakenshield to reclaim the Lonely Mountain, Gimli, at only 62, was considered too young for such a perilous quest. After the dragon Smaug was slain and the Lonely Mountain was retaken for the dwarves of Durin's folk, Gimli, together with his family, came to live there. Aside from this, we know surprisingly little of Gimli's life prior to his arrival at Imladris. We know that, as a princeling from the line of Durin, and with his father sharing in the loot as a full member of Thorin's company, he grew up a very wealthy dwarf. It was in the year 3017 of the Third Age that the wheels of fate would begin to turn for Gimli. It was in that year, as the clouds were darkening over Middle-earth, that a messenger came to the dwarves of Erebor, who claimed to ask for peace between Sauron and the dwarves, and also asked for any information on hobbits and a little ring, the least of rings, that once he stole. It is but a trifle that Sauron fancies, and an earnest of your good will. The dwarves denied this messenger, claiming to need more time to consider the offer, but they knew exactly who it was the Dark Lord sought. And so Gloin of the company was sent to Imladris to warn his old friend Bilbo and to seek the counsel of Lord Elrond concerning the rising darkness south of the Dwarven realm. However, as Gloin by then was already an old dwarf with his 235 years, he was accompanied by his 139-year-old son Gimli. And it is as such that we meet with Gimli. At the Council of Elrond, we are first introduced to him. Being one of the long beards, as Durin's folk was also called, Gimli had dark eyes and preferred to carry a broad axe. And as the newly formed Fellowship of the Ring went out from Rivendell, Gimli was clad openly in steel mail, with a helmet of iron and leather, much in the fashion of the dwarves. He was selected to represent the dwarves within the Fellowship, and as such he quickly distinguished himself in the group. He advocated crossing the Misty Mountains, which he could all name individually by their Khuzdul names, through the mines of Moria, eager to discover the halls of his ancestors. And when Gandalf was unsure of the way, Gimli proved a great help. For though Gimli had never set foot in that dwarven realm before, the unwavering courage of his people drove him on. And when the Fellowship faced the Balrog of Moria, it was the dwarf in the Fellowship who took the lead in Gandalf's stead, leading his companions across the bridge of khazad After that dreadful event, the remaining members of the Fellowship finally managed to leave those dark tunnels, and reaching, at last, the elven kingdom of Lothlorien in mid-January. There they rested a full month while the Fellowship drew new strength, and it was in those days that the extraordinary friendship between Gimli and Legolas began that would later develop into a strong bond. Extraordinary, for it was Legolas's grandfather Orofer who was one of the elves of Doria, and had witnessed the destruction of that sacred realm at the hands of the dwarves of Nogrod. And Gimli's ancestors had thus been snubbed and treated as vermin by their elven neighbors for thousands of years. 
Yet here, in Lothlorien, these ancient grudges held no sway over the two princelings, and towards each other they grew a friendship indeed extraordinary. Finally, in February, Galadriel and Celeborn bid farewell to the Fellowship of the Ring, and presented each of them with rich gifts. To the astonishment of all, Gimli denied to ask for anything, until the Lady Galadriel commanded him. There is nothing, Lady Galadriel, said Gimli, bowing low and stammering. Nothing, unless it might be, un unless it is permitted us, nay, to name a single strand of your hair, which surpasses the gold of the earth, as the stars surpass the gems of the mine. I do not ask for such a gift, but you commanded me to name my desire. The elves stirred and murmured with astonishment, and Celeborn gazed at the dwarf in wonder. For it was not the first time that Galadriel had been asked this question. Thousands of years ago, still during the age of the trees, before the sun itself rose for the first time, Feanor, son of the first king of the Noldor, and the greatest of all elven craftsmen, who had learned his craft from the Valar themselves, asked for a strand of her hair as well. But Galadriel, who saw the darkness deep within the great elf prince's heart, denied him. And here was a dwarf from a withered house, whose people struggled to maintain a realm of their own, and who had lost the splendor of their past and he asked the same. And when the lady asked him what he would do with such a gift, she could find in him no darkness, only purity. Then the lady unbraided one of her long tresses, and cut off three golden hairs, and laid them in Gimli's hand. With Lothlorien behind them, the fellowship finally met its end at the falls of Rauros, just beyond the Argona. There Boromir fell, Merry and Pippin were taken captive, and Frodo and Sam fled to go the long trek to Mordor alone. There Gimli, together with Legolas and Aragorn, decided to chase the band of orcs that had taken Merry and Pippin, managing to run further and faster than any dwarf in recorded history. Gimli kept up with Legolas and Aragorn for five days as the orc tracks led them to the edge of Fangorn Forest. And it was from here, after being reunited with the reborn Gandalf, that the now four members of the Fellowship made their way to Edoras to bring aid to Rohan. And it was here that one of the most famous battles of the War of the Ring happened. It, <laughs> no, no, not the Battle of Helm's Deep, but the battle that was held during that battle. Suddenly there was a great shout, and down from the dike came those who had been driven back into the deep. There came Gamling the Old, and Eomer, son of Eomund, and beside them walked Gimli the Dwarf. He had no helm, and about his head was a linen band stained with blood, but his voice was loud and strong. Party two, Master Legolas! He cried. Alas, my axe is notched! The forty-second and iron collar on his neck. How is it with you? You have passed my score by one, answered Legolas. But I do not grudge you the game. So glad I am to see you on your legs. Yes, the famous battle between the elf Legolas and the dwarf Gimli. Who could slay the most enemies? Both a remarkable testament to their skills as well as reminding one of the peculiarity of their deep friendship, in stark contrast to their people's previous hostility. It was also in that battle that Gimli performed one of his greatest feats in saving the life of Eomer, the future king of Rohan. For Eomer was thrown to the ground by orcs when he and Aragorn made a sally against the Dunlendings, but with just one mighty blow, Gimli slew two of them causing the rest to flee. Now after this battle, Gimli was present at Isengard, where he negotiated with Saruman before going back to the Hornburg. Along with Eladan and Elrohir, the sons of Elrond, 
and 30 Dunedain from the north, the dwarf, Legolas and Aragorn entered the paths of the dead. As the Grey Company, they wandered this dark power, though not in vain, for they actually managed to gain the renewed allegiance of the cursed dead men of Dunharrow as they arrived on the other side of the mountain. Together with the Shadow Host, the Grey Company now made their way to the coast of Gondor, to defend it against the Corsairs of Umbar under Sauron's command. The sight of the undead alone caused such fear and terror in the attackers that they fled in haste and offered no resistance. Finally, in Pelargir, the main battle ensued, which, thanks to the power of the Oathbreakers, was quickly won. But although the danger that came from the sea was now averted, Minas Tirith was already burning. On the morning of the 15th of March, Gimli in the Grey Company reached the heavily besieged capital of Gondor, where they brought death and destruction to Sauron's remaining troops. But though Minas Tirith too was safe, for now, the war was not over yet. For no matter the greatness of actions of Gimli, Legolas, Aragorn or their soldiers, only if Frodo would be able to destroy the One Ring, the free peoples of Middle-earth would be victorious. While Sauron drew more and more troops from Harad and Rune in the east, the captains of the west carried out one last diversionary attack. Their goal was to challenge the Dark Lord right outside his gates, thus drawing his eyes towards them, hoping against all odds that this would allow Frodo just that tiny bit of help should he, in spite of everything, be close to completing his mission. So it was that all the remaining forces and warriors were gathered again, and the army of the West rode out to Mordor. Minas Morgul was devastated, and a strong force of Easterlings were defeated until, at last, they came to the Black Gate. There, directly in front of the gates of the Dark Land, the decisive battle took place. Together with the other captains and companions, Gimli fought at the forefront of the battle. Though his survival, as well as the lives of all those surviving the slaughter, came down to the success of Frodo and Sam in destroying the ring. Here the tale of Gimli, for most who have read or seen the stories, ends. And though now you understand his names of Elf Friend and Lockbearer, there is still one title left to explain. Although the war was finally over, Gimli and Legolas decided not to retire, but instead continued to travel. Among others, they returned to Fangorn Forest and to the Glittering Caves, fulfilling their promises they had made to each other after the Battle of Helm's Deep, and they marveled at the splendor of these places. Eventually, Gimli returned to Erebor, where the War of the Ring had also taken its toll. Dain Ironfoot had been slain, and Thorin Stonehelm now reigned over Durin's foe. Eventually, the king allowed Gimli to return to the Glittering Caves with a contingent of dwarves, turning the caverns into the foremost colony of dwarves in the White Mountains, and turning him, in turn, Lord of the Glittering Caves. Together with Legolas, who now lived in Ithilien with his own group of wood elves, he would help rebuild Minas Tirith and give the city its new great gate, Roth of Mithril and Steel. And thus it remained until the year 120 of the Fourth Age, when Aragorn, King Elessar, died. By then, Gimli was 262 years old the second oldest ascertained age ever for a dwarf, barring Durin the Deathless himself. Although he was ancient, when his friend Legolas came to him, looking as young as he ever had, he felt that there was one last journey in him, and so the two friends made their way to the sea, and there they crossed the Belegar in an elven ship, along the straight road into the blessed realm of Valinor, and thus left Gimli, son of Gloin, 
and Legolas Greenleaf, the last of the fellowship to depart Middle-earth, and on the island of Dol Aresea it is said the dwarf met Galadriel one last time before dying peacefully, leaving the world of the living behind. Thus we conclude this chapter and this video. Did the knowledge surprise you? Let us know in the comments. If you enjoyed it and would like to help us spread the histories of Arda to the wider world, then please take a look at our Patreon and consider joining the different ranks of our supporters and have your names appear on screen here, as well as getting early access to our future videos and other boons. But regardless of that, be sure to subscribe and click the bell icon to be notified of the next chapter in the Mysteries of Westerness, when we will look at the most feared of all the Nazgul and the one who destroyed the Dúnedain kingdom of Arnor, the Lord of Minas Morgul, the Witch King of Angmar. But for now, I have been Irjikor Kuruvane, and I wish you all Namarie Eldonyar.